All right, hey guys, we're here for I think our fifth episode now of the, the Deck Talks. We've got Coach Keith Gorman, who uh, most would know you probably from Cumberland County, and you know now you're over at Barton, um, a legend in the the baseball world, especially over in Cumberland County. Really made a, a name for yourself. Um, a former player, we have Jay Carr with us. So I'm going to let Jay kind of introduce you and, and give a little background on uh, on uh, your successes. Well, you know, Coach, I know, you know, you had plenty of good teams throughout the years going in and out, you know, the top three spots. Um, you know, I think one of the most impressive parts about your resume is, you know, you uh, in 2019, you guys were the national champions. You know, that was pretty cool. Um, you know, I know I know you guys made it there before um, the year prior to I myself actually going to play for you, um, as well as, you know, being the national coach of the year in Division Three in 2019 also is an unbelievable I mean, considering how many good team programs and coaches that are out there, um, as well as, you know, you were juggling the director of athletics at the time, um, especially for a school that was kind of starting to expand a little bit um, athletically. And, you know, some of the teams were starting to grow and turn into better programs themselves, um, as well as, you know, you were the um, two-time region, ABCA region coach of the year as well uh, in 2017, 2019 for the region and the ABCA in 2014 and 2017. Um, all three of those years, you guys won all the league tournament titles. Um, I mean, six professional players signing contracts out of that area. I know that was unheard of, especially considering, but you got to get seven wins the year first, the year prior or your first year there? I think it was eight the year before I got there. Yeah. So it was eight, you know, so that's pretty incredible as well as, you know, Five All-Americans, three region pitchers of the year, one region player of the year as well. I mean, that's just absolutely incredible considering where that area is. Um, and, you know, just kind of getting the guys to come there. As well as, you know, when you were at Holy Spirit, New Jersey for 10 years, I mean, 120, 54, and one record over seven seasons is unbelievable as well as three conference championships and finishing a school best at 25 and five in 2011, uh, which is pretty cool. And then, you know, obviously playing at Kansas City, Community College in North Central Missouri before, uh, you know, coming over here to the East Coast is pretty cool as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you know, we'd love to hear about how you kind of got there, how you got, especially from Kansas City on over here, um, you know. Well, well, for, first of all, thanks, guys, for having me on. It's it's uh, it's great to be on a good show. And I actually watched um, watched your last one. You had you want to talk about a legend. I am no legend. Um, compared to coach. Uh, and uh, I think he was just on the main stage at the ABCA too, I believe. So um, kudos to you guys for, 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 uh, for having him on and all the other great uh, people he had on, but you know, how I got out to New Jersey, it's, it's, um, you know, it's kind of a, a funny story. You know, I, I followed my wife. Um, she had a job opportunity. My family's originally from New Jersey. So it was just kind of ironic. And I wasn't sure um, I wanted to, to, to get into coaching, you know, my father was a, a coach for 35 years and, you know, really basketball coach and uh, did a little bit of baseball, but, um, you know, sometimes uh, things happen in life and, and I was fortunate to, um, to get on at Holy Spirit High School. Um, and um, within, within the matter of days, uh, as soon as I started coaching there, I was, I was hooked and I guess it was in my blood. And, and at, from that point on, there was nothing else I wanted to do. Um, you know, I wanted to be in education. I wanted to be in athletics. And, and uh, it was uh, it was a great opportunity for me to be at a, um, you know, to be able to coach and be a head coach at such a young age um, in a parochial school in New Jersey, which, as people know, is, you know, very competitive um, athletically. Um, so I made a lot of mistakes and learned a lot early on. But um, but was really proud of my time there. And I, I tell anybody, anytime I talk to somebody, how proud I am of, of my time in high school. Um, I, I think I'm a better coach now because of it. Um, you know, really having to learn how to develop high school players in, in such a short season in a cold weather area, um, you know, really, um, really helped me advance as a coach so I could help them advance as players. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, you know, I, I know I've always been curious about how, you know, you kind of the whole Cumberland thing came to fruition, how you ended up there. I mean, you know, not nothing against the area. It's, you know, not obviously it's not the best place. If you show up, you're going to be like, oh, I can't wait to go here. Um, you yeah. know, the school was awesome. The people were awesome. And the baseball program was obviously awesome. But, you know, I know for some parents, they'd be a little bit worried sending their kids into 
um, Millville, New Jersey. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it, 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 it's an interesting story. I, I had never really heard of Cumberland County College, uh, to, to be honest with you. Um, a really good friend of mine and one of the one of the absolute best baseball coaches I've ever been around, George West, um, uh, let me know, played in the Brewers organization, I believe, when he was a player and was a longtime South Jersey high school coach. Um, and he's now a principal at Middle Township High School. But um, you talk about a guy that can flat out coach baseball. It was him. I had a ton of respect for him. We were extremely competitive, um, competing against each other as coaches. Um, and, um, you know, and, and he and I were, were, you know, he was a confidential friend of mine. And, you know, we'd talk about other opportunities that had come up for me to, to go into the college ranks. And it was just never the right thing. And he had some friends at Cumberland County. And, and, and to be honest with you, I, I really was kind of dismissing it. Um, and I was enjoying my time at, at Holy Spirit, you know, I didn't really think about making the move, but I went up there and, and interviewed for the job and they had a fantastic athletic director at the time, Bobby Amundsen, um, was a younger guy and, uh, was doing some good things and they were building a new baseball field and, you know, it, it started to grow on me. I start looking around and I'm thinking, you know, okay, you got some really great junior college programs in New Jersey, especially with Gloucester right there in the backyard. Um, but if I can tap into some some areas in Philly and, and maybe start stealing a couple of recruits here and there, and, you know, the Vineland Millville area, as you mentioned, you know, I mean, there, there was a ton of talent in that area as well. So, um, and not to mention the short air, shore area where I was, where I was currently working. So, um, then I started looking at their record and, and they hadn't had a winning season in 10 years and, and had won eight games the year before. And I think six the year before that and four the year before that. So I'm, you know, I'm going, ah, I don't, you know, the, you know, what's going on, but it just, it moved. And, and finally I got hired in, in September, which was really tough. I had to break that news to my high school players, which was absolutely at that moment in my life, the toughest thing I'd ever gone through because I love those kids and loved where I was at. And I felt like I was abandoning them. And, and um, you know, I didn't want, want to feel that way. And I didn't want them to feel that way about me either. But um, they understood and they were gracious and, and um, went to Cumberland. We weren't able to recruit. My first practice there, I had two guys. Um, I had two guys and uh, two coaches. So we were we were, we were matching the amount of players. And then by the end of the fall, I think we ended up having 12. I was able to get uh, about six transfers in. So we started the spring, in my opinion, the toughest, one of the toughest divisions, or one of the toughest junior college conferences, regions in the country with 18 players. Um, somehow we were able to, uh, I think we went 24 and 16. I, ju I just remember feeling really great about that. Um, you know, I, I thought uh, that we exceeded our, our ability level. Um, it was the first winning season they'd had in 10 years there. Um, and, you know, I was, I was really excited. And I, I, I still touch base with a lot of those guys from that first team that, you know, I was, I was extremely hard on them. Um, and um, they just kept coming to work every day. And, and, and I, I absolutely am proud of what we did. And, and, um, you know, so that, that's kind of how I got there. And then, you know, and two years later, you know, that year we, we brought in a pretty good recruiting class for, for that following year. And then two years later, we're, we're playing in the national championship game. So, um, you know, it was, it was a really special thing. And I think some people, especially close to me, were questioning my decision to go to Cumberland. But, um, you know, I, I think I believed in, in myself. I believed in, in the guy that was going to coach with me, Mike Freund, who's you know, dear friend and, and, um, you know, um, uh, you know, we just, we figured it out and uh, ended up being an awesome thing. And I hope it was an awesome thing for, for that school as well. I mean, I can say personally, it was one of, one of the better experiences I had. Um, you know, there's a lot of things I actually took out of that from a coaching standpoint as well. Now that, you know, we try to emulate a little bit in my style of coaching, especially on the offensive side. I mean, I'll tell you what, I've never met a coach that ran more, and just kind of got the game going. When there was dead points, we'd hit and run, we'd steal. We, it was just nonstop to it. I always thought that was something, you know, I kind of envied was, you know, we'd get thrown out, it was okay. We're going right again, right after the next guy. And, um, you know, as well as the coaching kid was unbelievable there, uh, you know, between Coach Froy and Coach Higby, Coach JD and everyone else that was there, as well as, you know, what she turned the place into by the time I got around. I mean, we had 
two guys, I think, on our team that ended up getting drafted or signed professional contracts. Yep. Angie and Latcham. Um, yep. And then there was probably a couple other guys who were walking around and they were younger or older, probably had a shot that might not have panned out. But, you know, there were some dudes walking around that field, that's for sure. Yep. Um, and because I think they've missed anything. How did you build the culture, uh, especially like going from a team that was eight wins? You know, how did you convince the guys to come in and then how did you get them to buy into what you were doing? <sighs> Man, it seems like forever ago. Um, you know, and I think I, to be honest with you, I was probably a little nuts and, and, uh, you know, and got some players that were a little nuts and we kind of just, we kind of just blended together, but, you know, and I say that jokingly, but the, the, the thing that I think I did, uh, most of, most of all of, 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 in my opinion, when you're trying to build a culture is, is, I mean, there were sure there was two or three things that we were going to do really well on a daily basis. Um, and they were really simple, and I didn't budge from those things. And, and still a lot of those things I, I, I hold dear today. Um, one of the number one things, and you'll remember this from being at Cumberland, is, is the weight room. Um, the, the weight room was really important to us. Uh, we, we had 6 a.m. workouts. Um, I can remember kids having to drive 50 minutes to get at 6 a.m. And, um, you know, that was just the culture that we were going to set. If you couldn't drive 50 minutes to get there at 6 a.m., you weren't going to be on Cumberland County College's baseball team. Um, and, um, you know, so I wanted guys that, that had some toughness and, and wanted to be there and, and wanted that, that grind piece. So that, that weight room was so important for us there. And, and, and I think really a big reason that, that we were, um, you know, big reason for our success, but also a differentiator between other programs we we're recruiting against, um, you know, being in Mike Trout's weight room, basically, and, 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 you know, having, um, his great influence and, and his trainers, you know, um, having influence on our guys and with developing the workouts, you know, was a, was a huge, huge motivating factor for us and also a great selling point for us. Um, you know, something real simple, you know, is, is that you were going to be on time every day. Um, you know, you were going to be on time because we had something we had to get done on a daily basis. And, and, um, you know, we were just going to respect each other by being on time and really being early. I mean, Jake, you know that, like, if you were on time, you're probably getting thrown out of practice. So, <laughs> you know, and, and then, and then from there, from the baseball side of it, we were going to play really hard, um, within the fundamentals of the game. Um, you know, I expected guys to, um, to play like they would in the game, which means diving all over the place and, you know. Um, getting hit by pitches when you need to and and you know all those things I, I just I had that expectation that we were going to play um, uh, we were going to practice like we were going to play games and so I think those were the three biggest things and, and and those all are to me are simple things but they have to be demanded and 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 um, and then when the players start to man demanded of each other which is what we had there um, you know it made I didn't have to police as much, you know, it was just an expectation from you guys. Um, and, and I just had a lot of fun with that, you know, uh, um, you know, cause that's what we wanted to get to. And we got there really quickly by getting great, great human beings in there. Um, you know, and, um, you know, that was awesome. You know, guys like, um, you know, Jake and, and a lot of the players I had there always wanting extra work and getting extra work and wanting to learn about the game. Um, you know, I, that's what it's about. It was never, uh, you know, I set a structure, but I had to have the right guys that wanted to be in that structure and, and keep each other accountable. And that's what we had. And, and um, I think that's why we built such a great winning culture, consistent culture and something I'm proud of. And um, I think more proud of than the other things you mentioned is from 2014 to 2019, um, nobody won more junior college baseball games in Cumberland County College. And um, that was something I was really proud of because of the consistency of those teams, even losing the good players we would lose year after year. Um, so um, really, uh, really a special thing in my opinion. No, that's awesome. Uh, and I can definitely remember the, uh, you know, you were always, yeah, we do an IO, right? Everyone's got a clean jersey. If you didn't die for a ball, you looking at you, are you crazy? <laughs> I for that thing right now but it was every day at practice there wasn't somebody that was what wasn't walking off the field just covered in dirt and mud I and mean, I even knew in practice we were running in fence for high pops and stuff whatever we had to do to kind of you know there there was that like tone that was set 
early on. It was set in the first week, by the way. I specifically remember that. My first week there, I was like, oh, my God. We're getting after it right off the bat. Um, as well as, you know, and it was held that way, kind of that standard was held in the weight room, too, and in conditioning. And, you know, I, I think one of the best – the thing I think I remember the best was we were on, I think, what, 94-game home winning streak at the time. And we were – came out – sluggish and I think we went down like eight nothing and it wasn't good <laughs> you know we stormed back came up. we ended up losing the game but he wasn't mad that we gave up all the runs he was mad at the effort that we came out of the gate with bro. and that was kind of the thing that really stuck out to me probably out of everything we went through was you weren't mad about the score you weren't mad about you know maybe we struck out whatever happened in the game the errors the physical errors we might have made it was more or less the mentality that we came out with that we thought we were going to maybe roll over someone or it would be easy. And we came out lackadaisical and someone took it to us. And um, that was probably the thing I remember the most about, you know, as a learning experience is, you know, you come in and you do and you work hard every day, whether it's first the worst team in the country, the best team in the country or anything you do. But that day is something that stuck with me ever since I was there was, wasn't that, you know, the score. And, you know, I think that's something kids probably, tend to forget is, you know, they think they're mad about the score or the results of the actual game. No, it's the way you actually physically came out and decided to play the game, the mentality and the effort that you gave me. And there's, I, you know, we talk about it all the time. There's a couple of things you can't control. One is your effort. And that's something that I kind of stuck with me ever since where it was, like, if you give effort and lose, it's okay. But if you don't give effort and lose, you deserve to get chewed out a little bit. Um, that was one awesome thing that I kind of took from there and I've kind of tried to, you know, and, and Jake, what you're talking about is exactly what we still talk about today. You know, you hardly ever hear me talking about wins and losses to our team when when we're there because baseball's you know how miserable baseball is. You can play your best game ever, and and you know just by luck, you know you lose the ball game because of, of whatever reason. Um, you know, I, I try still to this day to get our guys focused on the process um of you know putting yourself in a in a position that gives you a higher probability of winning a baseball game or or winning that pitch because it, the game's just too difficult and sometimes you're running somebody that's better than you and and you know it just that is what it is but you know are you doing things on a daily basis and you talk about your effort and enthusiasm um you know are you taking enough ground balls on a daily basis with a game like mindset so that you have a higher percentage chance of of you know, being a great fielder um, on game day, are you taking enough cuts? You know, so to me, that that to me, the process was always more important than than the result. Now, listen, I didn't want to lose, you know that, uh, but uh, but the process is what I wanted us to, you know, to really dive into and and to love, you know, um, and then you know, hopefully, you know, if you do that enough, at the end of the year, you got a chance to win the last game. Yeah, so I think that's awesome. Yeah. I, um, yeah, I, I guess more like kind of mentioned this before, shifting gears a little that falls into the culture is fine. You like you say, you got to find the guys that kind of buy into what your your culture is, which I can tell is kind of it's a niche style. It's you know, you want those nitty gritty guys that want to get dirty. And, you know, sometimes you might get that guy who's got the five tools, but he's a little I can tell you probably one guy, you, you take the guy that's going to dive into the fence that's got three tools versus the five tool guy that's worried about his Evo shield, you know, looking good and all that kind of stuff. So um, how do you, when, when you recruit, is there certain things you look for? Is it the way the guy warms up? Maybe like you're probably looking for something a little bit past just their physical appearance and stuff that, to, that you know you can work with. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I, I think, you know, we're always looking, I mean, just, just to, we're always looking for one tool that we think can help us win. You know, does the guy have a really great arm or does he have really great speed or, you know, does he have, you know, legit juice? I mean, we're in a world now where, you know, we, we're training all hitters like power hitters, which is, um, you know, I could, I could spend three days on that. It's an absolute, absolute travesty what's going on with that. But um, you know, we're, we're looking for a tool. Uh, we're looking for something. But then besides that, because I always feel like if I can get a guy with one tool, we can help him maybe deliver, you know, um, you know, in, in a certain way in the game. And then he can, while he's developing, you know, maybe some other tools. 
um, you know, or, or honing his abilities. But, you know, I'm looking for a guy, um, and, you know, that has great energy and, and you know, um, has just that motor, like it stands out. Um, he's a guy that's hopping up on the field. It, it's, it's an enthusiasm um, and it's a, it's a tough minded mindset. I, I want guys that are a little fiery that I gotta, that I gotta pull back a little bit before they, they embarrass us, you know, like I'm okay with that guy. Get, give me that guy. And, and you know, we'll, we'll teach him a little bit. Um, you know, that, that doesn't, that doesn't bother as long as they're, they're, they're respectful. Um, you know, I need some guys that are fiery and, and, and may even be fiery with me at times because I'm certainly trying to draw it out of them, you know, um, but that's, that's what we look for when we're, we're somewhere. I, I look at a guy who's, who's, um, you know, not just playing hard when people are looking or when he thinks it's important, but playing hard all the time because he enjoys it. Um, you know, Jake mentioned the uniform's dirty. I mean, I, our guys always, even now at Barton, I mean, they're leaving the field and they look like they, you know, rolled around in the dirt for a while, you know, um, you know, we had a ton of those guys and, and that, that's who we want. So the, the players we're looking for, they've got to have a tool, at least one. Um, but you know, we'll take a pass on a guy that doesn't want to play hard. Um, that's a character issue in my opinion. Um, and that, that I don't have any, I can adjust behaviors, you know, just goes back to the guy that maybe loses his mind a little bit. We can adjust that behavior, you know, but guy who just doesn't want to play hard or that's beneath him. Um, to me, that's a character issue. And I, I, I can't do a whole lot with that guy. And, um, you know, and, and to be honest with you, I'm at a point, you know, in, in my career and in, in coaching where, where I have no interest in, in, you know, trying to correct that. So, um, you know, I, I think that's, that's the main thing is, you know, and I tell our players here, um, what's the one thing that you do at an elite level? Okay. You know, figure that out. And then let's try to do some things at, at, a, at a, a, an above average level. We got some really good players here at Barton right now, just like I did at Cumberland. Um, but, um, you know, they got to find out what's going to get them in the lineup. You know, it may only be one thing. They may be a, a plus defensive guy. Okay. Keep doing that really well. That, that'll keep you in a lineup in my program. Do you think there's um, an extra level of communication on your end of letting the guys know where they stand in the lineup for, from top to bottom? And I think that's something we've talked about with a lot of the other coaches is you've obviously created a, a good culture that wins and works and that there's something to making the, the, the 18th guy feel just as part of it as the you know, one, two, three hitter. And, and how do you how do you create that? And how do you keep that guy engaged and hopeful and working hard to be ready for his his shot? Yeah, well, it, it you know, and and I hope that the players that have come in my program, you know, have this experience. You know, Jake was in my program, but Jake was an everyday player. I don't, I don't really ever remember Jake being out of the lineup. But there's guys that were on his team that that were not everyday guys or guys that maybe were thinking about you know, the next year. Um, I, I don't know if I have all the right answers if I, or if I've always done it the right way, but what I've tried to do is be honest with them. Um, and and depending on their questions and, and how they approach it, sometimes it's, it's brutal honesty. Um, and um, because I, I didn't want them, whether they agreed with me or not, you know, there was one guy right in the lineup and it wasn't them. So, you know, they needed to know exactly where they stood in my eyes so they could, um, you know, so they could get, get it figured out. And, and we, we did a lot of talking about that. And, and I don't know how many times that, you know, a guy who hadn't played very much, but had worked hard all year. And then all of a sudden he's, you know, you're an injury away and he's in a big spot. And I always felt like that guy was ready. Um, I tried to always hold up my end of the bargain that you, if you were in my program, whether you're our three hole hitter or whether you're our 16th position guy on the team and, you know, may get four at bats during the year that you were going to get coached as hard um, as our top player. I tried to coach all of our guys very hard. I tried to demand a lot from them because I knew that they would get better at what level would they get better it would depend on their ability and how much extra work they did and, and, and things like that. So I tried, I try still to this day to be very honest, 
Um, I have great kids in my program here and, and it's really tough to get in our lineup and, and, and get innings and, and, you know, and I tell them all the time in practice and, um, you know, maybe I should do it more as I tell them, if you want to come talk to me about this, my door is always open. Um, I don't want you to wonder. Now, a lot of times they know where they're at, you know, they, they know where they're at. They know, you know, listen, you know, um, I'm behind Jake at first. He's just, you know, he's a better hitter than I am right now, but I, I'm going to, I'm going to try to steal it from him. The, those are the type of guys I want, you know, steal it in the right way and, and working hard. But um, a lot of times they know where they're at, but I, I think that's all you can ask from a program whether you always like the answers or not, that you know where you stand. You know, Jake was an energy guy, and I hate to keep using Jake, but he's here with me. You know, now he's – he's that's why he's going to be a great coach because he cared about all the little things. But, um, you know, Jake was a guy I never had to worry about his, his energy. Um, and if I did, he would hear about it immediately, you know, like other guys. So that also is holding our guys accountable and letting them know where they're at. Um, if I think they're dogging it in long toss, which is very important to my programs, both as pitchers and position players, I'm going to let them know. I'm not going to wait. I'm not going to let them guess. I mean, that's just not how I am. I can't hold it inside. You know, that's for my mental health. Um, I, I'm not going to, I, I just don't hold things in. If I see something I don't like, you're going to hear about it. Um, and, and, you know, if you don't like that level of honesty, maybe go be just a general college student. You know, um, you know, because maybe, you know, athletics aren't for you if you can't take some constructive criticism, but just being honest as much as you can, I think, is the best thing for that. You know, I think I can, I'm going to, you know, personally, I kind of went through the whole thing that you just kind of explained in that one year that I was there. You know, I came in from another school, um, kind of came in, it was at the bottom of the deck chart because that's how it happens when you come in. And there was a kid who was there at the time who had played some first base in DH. His name was Artie Ocasio, who could, had a very pretty left-handed swing, and he could hit. Um, and, you know, we went through the thing, and, you know, it was the same thing. We went through the first couple of weeks, we didn't play a game, but you always felt like you were being coached, whether you were, you know, the first guy off the line or whatever it was. But I remember we went and played uh, the Dell Tech, the first one, I think, that fall. Who, who was that? I think it was Dell Tech, that first oh. fall game at their place. And yep. we made the first game, and the first game was the starters, pretty much, who at that point were the starters. I remember sitting there, and I was like, this is unbelievable, you know. You're angry, and I, I remember it kind of just being like, you were angry because you were getting answered with everybody else. Um, yep. You know, unlucky for me in the second game, you know, I ended up having a pretty good day and had a good fall and, you know, ended up earning a position over there. But I can specifically remember that kind of happening to the point where it was like, this is truly how it's going to be. Um you know, we have to, you know, you have to gain your starting position here. And, you know, one way or another, it's not going to be given to you. No matter what you put up last year, what you did two years ago, what you did in high school is you were going to come here and you were going to win your job. Um, and that was kind of something that was really apparent to me at that first scrimmage. That was kind of something I respected um, as well as there was definitely times, you know, I hit third form for a whole year and there were times when, I miss pitches and he knew I missed it. And I knew I missed it with guys in second and third and, you know, one out or less than two outs. And, you know, I didn't get a job though that I heard it from. And, you know, at the time, you know, was I necessarily happy about hearing it from Coach Gorman after I was already, you know, I was an angry person as it was. So I'd be coming in the dugout already angry at myself, you know, probably saying every curse word under my breath on my way back in. And right as I walk in, you know, coach is sitting there going, got to get a job though. But it was kind of that standard that, you know, in big situations, you know, you kind of ended up figuring it out a little bit. Um, as well as, you know, Coach, I can specifically remember when Mixon couldn't run in the very last game. We flopped. And that was like, I don't know what we were doing. We were going into an elimination game. I hit third, another kid, Mixon, and hit second the whole year. The kid hurts his hamstring. Coach comes out to us because we're flopping you guys because Mixon can't run. And we're looking at him like, the last game, the elimination game, all line, we're switching this up. But, you know, it ended up working out for us pretty well. You know, we ended up losing the game on a tough play at the end. But, you know, it we scored runs. We got stuff done still. And it was kind of decisions like that. Um, and trust the trust that you kind of instilled in us is something that I kind of, to this day, still kind of, you know, it, it try to take it in. You know, trust your guys. That's why you're going to make that switch. You know, if you didn't trust your guys, you're not going to flop your two and three hitter and think they're going to get the job done either way. Um, and that's kind of something I think that's come into it. And just the way you've kind of coached and 
bringing in those types of kids, kids who are okay with making that switch about 10 minutes before the game in the dugout when everyone's swinging it back, getting loose for the first inning. Um, you know, but that's kind of, you know, I can tell you this much, dude. I probably learned more about coaching baseball and college baseball from you than I did anywhere else I did. And I played for some really good coaches along the way. But, you know, I think playing for you was where I really learned a lot about college baseball and what it's all about and, you know, these expectations and stuff like that. Um, and you were probably the only coach that helped me um, – to a different standard than, you know, everywhere else I kind of went, it was, you know, just keep hitting, just keep hitting, just keep it. Here it was hit, play defense. I remember I couldn't throw when I got there. I couldn't reach third base. And we were in Ohio, threw it across, and it one hop, and the kid missed it. He looks at me, he goes, if you can't reach third base, you can't play first base for me. I'll never forget, I don't think I've been out on the rest of the year. But it was that that made you reach first base. It was that that made you long toss a little bit farther. Um, and it was stuff like that that kind of made us, you know, that top team. And it, it, was, it was definitely one of the better experiences I had going through that. Good. Well, thank you for saying that. I think kind of building off that, too, I'd be curious to hear, um, like you said, you thought coaching high school kind of really helped with your coaching career. I'm guessing that kind of went back to how to, like, structure practices and, and how to be as efficient as possible. Like you said, in a short season, you know, you got guys not all completely focused, wanting to play in college, you know. So the the development side, um, and like you said, you're you're sometimes looking for just a one tool guy. I'll help them develop. Where D one coaches and things like that, they're looking for. They don't want to have to develop too much. They're looking for guys that kind of already have it all. And they can just plug them in. What? Um, you know, what has changed maybe or what have you found is kind of without giving too many secrets away, you know, staples of, of your practices, because I, you know, I've always found coaching myself is I'm, I'm not too loud in games because I, I do my yelling and coaching at practice. When, by the time the game starts, you should kind of already know what to do. And I'm just kind of guiding things a little bit. But, you know, yeah, I would love to hear a little bit about how you structure your practices and some of the things you really hone in on. Yeah, this is my favorite topic to talk about is, is practice structure because because I as you mentioned that that is our job. You know, um, I get into to game day and you know we have some decisions to make, but they're really very minimal. Um, you know, when you look at it, and you know what I try to do in game is challenge our guys if I don't think that they're they're in the right mindset. You know, I might just try to switch that 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 a little bit. But practice is where we, we coaches we've got to earn our money, so to speak. Um, and, you know, I, I, I go back to my days as a high school teacher. If I wasn't highly organized and didn't have things going every minute, I was going to have some classroom discipline problems. Okay. So um, the more people stand around, the more they're going to find other things to do to occupy their time that maybe aren't in the best interest of me running a, an effective classroom. So I, I feel that Baseball practice is no different. In baseball, it, it actually makes my blood boil when I'm at a baseball practice and there is just tons of guys standing around. Um, it, it makes the game not fun, in my opinion. And I, I, you know, I have a football, a little bit of a football background too. And I try to take that into, into how I organize practices. And, you know, even though my baseball practices are long, I don't think the guys feel that way because they are constantly moving around. So we have we have lots of stations. I have great coaches that I, I have on staff that, you know, for individual sessions and things like that. So I try to organize it to a point where it's faster than anything that they're going to experience in a game. Um, and that's the only way I know what to do. And, you know, the minute we start standing around, they lose focus and, and really it's, it's a waste of their time and, and a waste of waste of time for them to develop and get better. So um, I've become, you know, and was and, and still am. I, I try to learn new things to do at practice and how to how to make them flow more. I have great coaches now that I give a lot of responsibility to help with that. Um, you know, so we, we really have a, a lot of stations going on all over the place. Our batting practice sometimes has five or six different things going on. I spend a lot of time. Um, writing practice schedules, not only daily, but for the week and months and, and really thinking about how I want that to build on top of each other. Um, but 
you know, bottom line is, is we don't do a lot of conditioning, you know, maybe unless we were, we're we got some discipline conditioning going on, but um, you know, I want our guys moving around really fast. We don't walk anywhere. Um, you know, I want those guys sprinting. Defensive work is going to be very intense and, and full speed. And um, I, I, to me, that's fun. You know, who wants to stand around? Like, you know, I go to a baseball practice and there's, you know, 12 kids in a line taking ground balls. So in, in 10 minutes, they get three ground balls. I mean, who would want to play that sport? You know, I, I mean, that, you know, just blows my mind still to this day. So um, the more efficient um, that we are in practice and the less standing around we have, um, guys are guys are going to get better. And, and I learned a lot of that in high school. Um, and, and the tough part I think about is in high school is that, you know, when you're on your high school team, you know, maybe you got one or two college players on that team. You know, um, if you're lucky, you know, if you're really good, maybe three or four, but the rest are you know, our kids are just wanting to play and, but want to get better and don't want to be embarrassed when they play. And um, so they have pride and all that stuff too. So you gotta, you gotta learn how to adjust your coaching um, within your practice schedule to different talent levels. Um, and, and also, you know, I, I laugh when I was at, I was a first year head coach at 24 at Holy Spirit. So I was a couple minutes older than some of my seniors. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was down in Holy Spirit, which is a beach area. Uh, in Absecon, you know, we had a lot of guys that were beach kids coming over from Margate, Ventnor, Atlantic City, Brigantine. And, and um, you know, I, I think I remember losing my mind one time in practice. You guys want to be lifeguards or do you want to be baseball players? <laughs> and, and I remember one of my assistant coaches saying to me later, he said, coach, you better be careful because they may want to be lifeguards. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, as funny as that was, it, it was, you know, it was me being a young coach and learning that you know, not everybody has the same drive and the same intensity as I do and, and doesn't um, have baseball in the same, um, you know, maybe as, as important as, as the other guys. So how do I still coach those guys? Because they want to be coached, you know, um, and, and how do I keep them engaged and involved? And, and, and maybe how do I get them better without them knowing I'm getting them better? So um, my suggestion to any, any, any coach, and I did it when I was younger, is is go out and um, watch some practices from some programs that, that have really run efficient and effective practices and, and take notes. I mean, I've, I've had younger coaches come to me and ask, can I come and watch practice? Can I talk? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, um, so, um, but my suggestion always um, is, is to get as many things going as once and don't be afraid to experiment and it be a failure and then adjust it, you know, um, but uh, standing around in baseball is, uh, it, it just, it stinks. I don't know any other way to say it. Yeah. I, I agree. I think that's something we battle, especially now that, you know, working more with the youth players and as lacrosse has grown and being in the same season, you know, those kids tend to a lot of times be those somewhat more athletic kind of hyperactive gritty kids that I know it's become a challenge to, not lose the interest in them when they're young, because I mean, I know personally, I, I played soccer, basketball, and baseball all the way up through through high school, and I didn't really like baseball that much until yep. kind of the, I wanted to keep playing something, and you know, the writing was on the wall. Being a five ten white guy that couldn't jump that high, uh, so um, but it, it was boring to me a little bit when I was young and. But again, I think that, like you said, that goes back to creating just a funner environment. Um, I guess we, that's something we've, we've talked about too, not to we can jump back a little bit, but is there anything you see lacking in the youth kind of travel world and just in general on the instructional side that you've seen like when you're getting guys that like, man, this seems to have tailed off a little or something I didn't really have to cover as much. And I personally know we work, you know, a lot of little league guys, I just catching and throwing in general has kind of like gone downhill because, you know, one is obviously COVID and things like that, but in general, kids just aren't outside playing. You know, we were constantly yeah. playing run the bases and football and catching and throwing. So, um, but is there anything in general, I'm gonna guess maybe bunting because everyone's trying to hit home. <laughs> <laughs> things like that that you see that we could focus on more yeah I mean I think there's two things for me and, and you hit the nail on the head 
Um, number one, proper proper techniques um, in, in our game, and you know, uh, simplifying those techniques. Um, you know, I, I think Jake can attest to this: is that even at the college level, there's things our guys do every day, every day to to make sure that their their um, proper ground ball technique is is being done on a daily basis in our program. Um, that needs to be that that needs to be better at the lower levels. And I used to give a coaching clinic um, for the town I was living in in South Jersey to their little league coaches. And um, and I really would, you know, my kids were in those organizations. So it was a little bit personable, personal for me. And I couldn't help coach, you know, because of my schedule. And um, I really tried to give them a lot of those things that they could do to help those kids catch and throw better. All right because it doesn't change at the college level either. We need to play a really high level of catch and throw or we're going to lose ball games. You know, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it doesn't get any simpler than that. I don't, like if we can't catch a ground ball, you know, even if we got a good arm that guy can throw a bunch of ground balls, it, those, those things don't, you know, don't work out. That's why striking out doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, but that's a whole nother subject for another day. Um, so I think that the, the hard fundamentals, you know, um, you know, those need to be to to be coached a lot more. And and, you know, I think sometimes there's it's hard to find guys who really understand what all those are. But there's certainly enough resources out there to 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 figure that out. Um, I would like to see a little bit more of a balance in, in the younger levels with practice and games. Um, what I see right now is a lot of games, which I think are good. Um, you have in baseball, you have to play. I mean, there's no way you can get better in, in a game setting unless you play in a game. But at the same time, if, if you're playing games um, and not practicing, I don't think that's any good because you don't have a chance to reinforce some of the things that need to be done better, um, you know, or things that they're just missing on. Um, so so practice needs to happen. And, and I think defensive fundamentals are, are something that can be fun in practice if you keep a moving and and, and listen, you know, the tough part about baseball, the miserable part about baseball is nobody likes to make errors or look bad. And it's a really difficult game. So if they don't have the fundamental base, it makes that game that much harder, you know, and that's why we lose kids out of baseball to basketball or football, you know, um, because, because they don't understand how to play the game to make it a little bit easier um, so they can have some success. Um, the, the other thing, you know, I think is it's not never too early to start teaching them how to play the game. Um, baseball is a cat and mouse game and it will always be pitchers are trying to set up hitters, you know, hitters should be trying to set up pitchers. Although I think we're losing some of that, um, you know, with, with, you know, with the, you know, sometimes we don't foul off as many balls as we probably should, or learn how to, how to do some of those things, but they need to actually learn how to play the game. They need to learn how to hit behind a runner who's on second base with no outs. Big leaguers do that. You know, they need to learn how to hit and run. They need to bunt, you know, and, and I think when you play games all summer um, and, you know, you only have 12 or 13 guys and everybody's trying to, you know, you play sometimes that, that stuff misses, but I will tell you this, uh, the majority of the college baseball programs that I know that win at a consistent level, you don't know how to bunt, you know, you, you're, you may not find yourself in the lineup. Um, I was speaking here. Here's a great story. And man, I wish I would have filmed him when he was speaking. Um, I was over in, in uh, Greensboro talking at a baseball academy over there. It was run by Scott Bankhead, who was a big league pitcher for a number of years. Um, uh, he had, uh, I'm in there. I talk to their kids and watch them hit a little bit. And, and then he, he, he has Whit Merrifield come in and talk to the guys. And, and if you don't know who Whit Merrifield is for anybody listening, he's, he's, uh, he's had more base hits than George Brett at the same point in his career. So um, pretty good, pretty good Kansas city Royal. And, you know, Whit had a great, great college career, but the stories he was telling was unbelievable. You know, you wouldn't believe the talent he was surrounded himself with at South Carolina. And all he did was bunk for those guys as a freshman. And that's why he stayed in the lineup. You know, now you're talking about a big leaguer now and a guy who won, uh, had the game-winning hit for South Carolina in the College World Series championship, whenever that was in 2009, and he made the he he made it in the lineup every day because he could bunt. That's at South Carolina; they're pretty good down there, you know. So, um, and you know, I, I think there's some of that that we miss. Um, 
I think we need to figure out who we are. It, you know, if you can bunt, be a really great bunter. If, if, if you got really good speed, figure out a way to steal bases. You know, we need to, we need to help them with that, help them watch pitchers and the catchers and the middle infielders and, you know, really learn about, about the game and, and how it is a cat and mouse. Okay, they're weak in this area. So we're going to exploit that. You know, I don't know if we always we always look at that. And, and um, I, I just I think that that to me, that's the biggest thing I see. I, you know, I see a lack of fundamentals in our game. Um, and I, I see um, I see a lack of understanding um, how to play the game, especially with base running and, and, and you know, hitting and um, strategy, you know, those types of things. Right. Yeah, I can definitely attest to the bug for a base hit. Mm-hmm. Definitely a test. Now, I actually have a good story based off of that from the fall when we were in Wilmington. So he always said, if you can't get your bonds for a base hit, then you will not take deep hit. <laughs> <laughs> we're at Wilmington, right? Do I foul off like three or four of them? Then he Next get guy. out. Next guy. Get out. Throws me. <laughs> I get out. I don't even take any deep hit. But I'll never, I was sitting there. I was like, really? Really? I didn't get, I think I got like one of four down. He's like, nope, get out. I was like, oh, damn it. <laughs> But, you know, and it was true because we used it an unbelievable amount. And, you know, I, I know in some weekend series, if, you know, some of us lefties got a little pool happy because, you know, they might have been getting a little fed inside or something. They kind of had the third baseman shift away from the line. First thing we'd do, right, is Coach Saul, he'd give us the bunt sign, bang, we'd lay it down. And you know, at least one time it turned into a double because they shifted somebody so far over. Um, but, you know, it, it really is something that I think, you know, you do focus on extremely well compared to a lot of other programs I've seen is, you know, one through nine can bunt and can bunt for a base hit. And it's something that, you know, if you can bunt for a base hit and not have to sacrifice, you're not necessarily giving up and out while moving a runner over to, which sometimes, I mean, you know, from experience, it leads to huge innings where, you know, you get three, four, five runs. And, you know, we always talked about that at Cumberland was let's try to get a big inning. You know, let's try to eliminate the big inning, but let's try to put up a big inning. But, you know, if you do the fundamental things, it's weird how it ends up being, a big inning compared to, you know, any guy with D, I think you get three hits in a row, four hits in a row. It's not an easy thing to do. And especially at the higher levels when, you know, some of these guys are throwing 90, 92 with six inches of movement. Good luck. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> You're sure. And I think that goes back to the kind of player you are. You want a guy who wants to bunt. He doesn't care. Yeah. He's not going to give you that. Well, I'm, I don't, I'm not a bunter. It's like, yeah, you want those guys who no matter, they know what the situation is and they want to execute based on, you know, winning and beating yeah. the other team and stuff. So, uh, but I think that that's obviously, you know, I can tell you're a humble guy. That's a, a testament to, you know, everyone in the end, you lead by example. So yeah. I think the, the culture you've created, the players that you're drawn to your program, in the end, they're, they're, they're drawn to you. And I think that's, um, you know, for a guy who runs a, a business to a degree, it's, it's hard, man. It's, and it can be very exhausting and stuff. I, I guess one kind of, I could talk to you forever, but start to wrap it up. There's something you could tell the 24 year old you, what would it be? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I have a long list, right? I'm sure. But I don't, you know, I, I think, I think I kind of already med- mentioned it, but you know, I think the 24 year old me, if I could go back and, and talk to that fiery, um, confident, um, you know, person, you know, I, th- I think I'd tell him it, it is take a, take a deep breath, <laughs> you know, number one and, and, and number two, remember not everybody thinks like you, um, you know, and, and, uh, you know, I, I think that's really important lesson for all young coaches to, to learn is that, um, we are all different thinkers and we all have different strengths and, and different mindsets and we all have different problems too. And um, how do you reach all those guys? Cause that is our job as coaches is, is, is to reach everybody, not just the ones that it's, it's convenient or easy to reach, um, you know, and, and um, you know, so I think that's, that's the biggest thing. I think I, you know, it's a little off topic for what we're going to talk about, but you know, I thought we finished with a little hitting. Why not? Right. I, you know, coach, I'd love to know what you guys are doing. You know, and I think getting, you know, some of the people up here um, in the PA, New Jersey area, a little bit more about Barton, Barton baseball, you know, what kind of technology you guys are doing in hitting. Uh, you know, I'm not a big pitching guy. So, you know, we can save the pitching for another day. 
but you know, I'd love to know what kind of you know, how you guys are using it to develop guys. You know, maybe some of the things you guys are doing with your hitters, and then you know, maybe a couple things you tell a young hitter to focus on. Um, you know, that might help them be really be able to excel and get a shot at the next level. Yeah. So, Jake, I, I, you know me. I love talking about hitting, and and we are a pressure predicated offense. Um, you know, you mentioned it fun earlier and you probably remember me saying that there's always a ton of Joe, Joe Tories up in the stands and I could care less what they think about what we're doing. As long as we're all together and we're, we're bought in, you know, we're going to, we're going to sometimes look bad out there, but, uh, we're also going to look pretty good when we put up eight on them in the second inning. So, um, you know, I, I, I think, I think a couple of things that, that we do and, and, you know, we use a lot of video still that 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 doesn't change. And we, we try to use a lot in the fall because I don't like to, you know, for guys and Jake, you were one of these guys, guys that really care about their swing and wanting to perfect it um, and and make sure that it, it's it's a sound mechanical swing. I think sometimes video can, um, you know, paralyze those guys in the spring. So you got to be really careful with who you do that with. Um, you know, a measurement tool that we use more to, to show the guys that they need to be inside the baseball a little bit more and, and the weight room and hand and wrist strength. We do use exit velo, but that doesn't mean you can hit, you know, certainly. And I don't pay any attention to Major League Baseball exit velo because, you know, they strike out so much if, if they're, you know, like an old school hitter that, you know, has a great two strike approach, hits a little, you know, a little dying quail over the first baseman's head. Um, you know, that exit below is not going to register. That guy's a pretty darn good hitter that I want in my lineup, you know, so we use it more from a, you know, Hey, you got to get stronger, you know, this is going to help you get inside the baseball and those type of things. But Jake, I, I think the biggest thing that we do, and I hope we did this effectively. And, and I've got, I've got a really great hitting coach here right now. Um, coach Corey Dunbar, who was a fantastic player at university of North Carolina. And then was in the Marlins organization. He, he's, he just really does a good job, and that's why he and I have clicked. Um, here is, I think, in baseball, we have a, we have a, major, um, a major teaching gap from teaching guys the mechanics and, and the cage work to that carrying over to them being productive hitters in game situations. Um, because if you're in the cage, you should be focused on your mechanics and executing certain things. But if that's your, what you're doing in the games or really even BP on the field, um, you're, you're kind of missing the point. So we do a lot of that. Like, how do we get our swing and it could say, you know, and I like, what's the difference between a, a curveball swing and a, and a fastball swing? Well, there is none, you know, our swing is our swing, you know, but we, we need to, we need to understand how to approach the curveball and, and maybe what count we're looking for and whatnot. And that's, you know, advanced scouting stuff and, and things that we're able to do, at, you know, at the college level. But, um, but bottom line is that um, if our guys are five o'clock hitters, you know, which we used to use that term all the time, um, you know, we're not going to be very successful come, come game day. So we have got to bridge that gap of cage hitting, um, working on the mechanics of the swing to, working on executing and, and being a good game day hitter. Um, so I, I think that's what what um, we've tried to do and what I think we've done really well. And, you know, we were talking about the bunning piece. I remember, you know, um, and I can't remember if you played with him for a year, but Chris Salvi, um, who's, a, who's a Philadelphia Catholic League kid, um, you know, we, we had a lot of success with going up and getting Philly guys. And um, Chris, his sophomore year, led the country in home runs. Um, but Chris, who is not a very good runner and Chris, I'm sorry to say this, but if you're watching, you know that, but he can absolutely hammer baseballs. Um, Chris would drop down a bump for base hit every once in a while because the third baseman was 25 feet behind the bag, you know? And I think he was, if I remember right, three or three or four for four on bump for base hits. Now I was upset with him every time, but you know, it was just the kind of, the kind of guy he was, he wanted, you know, he wanted to get on base and that was a team mindset. That wasn't a. That wasn't a, a me, me, me. And there's a guy who we wanted to swing in most home runs in the country as a sophomore, you know? So, um, you know, we're, we're really just looking for that complete hitter and trying to help them um, understand being a complete hitter. And, and you don't have to go too far. I mean, you know, Major League Baseball, the, the MLB B Network's doing a great job getting these, you know, elite hitters in, in Major League Baseball and, and listening to what their routine and what their process is. And, 
And, um, you know, it's a lot different than sometimes what the Twitter hitting world is, is putting out there. And, and I think they should probably listen a little bit more, not that you can't learn something from everybody, but you know, if I, I got a big leaguer, um, who, who's doing it at a high level, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to want to pick his brain. It doesn't have to be exactly what we do or what we teach, but I, I'm going to want to pick his brain. Cause there's probably some things I can pick up from that. And, and, um, but I hope that answered your question. But I, I, you know, I think those are some of the things that we do down here. And um, uh, I think in very short order, we'll have um, some very good offenses down here in, in Barton and we'll, we'll score some runs in a ton of different ways. And I definitely did. And, you know, I think I learned after Conlon to stop watching video. Mm -hmm. of <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, but no, you know, Coach, that was awesome. Um, you know, I guess the last thing from a hitting piece is, you know, what would be some advice for maybe a high school kid who's coming up and, you know, they're trying to figure out the right uh, fundamentals or the right things to do to become a good hitter? Um, you know, what would, kind of advice would you give them for maybe a fundamental standpoint as well as, you know, maybe a mental side of it as well? I mean, you know, I don't want to give away your secrets about the approach and sure. all that, but, you know, just a little gist on it. Yeah. So, you know, from a fundamental side, you know, I, I would tell them, you know, to spread their feet and get in the ground, um, you know, in, until they learn how to control the barrel. Um, that, that is the most important thing in hitting is, is hard contact. So if you're not getting hard contact, there's probably a lot of movement in other areas of, of your swing. Um, I see more guys, more and more young hitters with their feet together and, and, you know, it's just not the reality in the big leagues. And especially at our levels, you get up the levels, you know, you, you know, if your front foot's not on the ground, you, you can't hit, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't see anybody on one foot, their back foot swinging the bat effectively. It's just, you know, maybe there's that guy out there. I just don't know where he is. Um, I, I would say they need to simplify that, spread their feet, get their hands back. Um, so they're not in a good position. I see a lot of our, I see a lot of young kids with their hands here, you know, um, and, and I would, I would, you know, really um, have them get their hands back and, and really get their feet in the ground. And uh, so they're throwing their top hand and, and their back foot at the same time. Um, I think the simpler it is, and also letting them figure it out off the tee to set up the tee, you know, there, hopefully there's a back net 50 feet away. Um, see how many balls you can hit hard into that back net. Um, that means your swing pass in a pretty good spot. That's simple. Okay. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's, it, you know, it, it doesn't seem real complicated, but this game is not complicated. You know, if you hit the ball hard, you got a good chance of getting a hit. And, uh, you know, that, that's what we need to figure out. But, um, you know, you look at all the best hitters in baseball, their hands are back and their feet are in the ground. You know, find a way to look like them. You know, maybe my, the way I coach, you're not understanding it, but I would say, you know, go look at, go look at Miguel Cabrera, do that. Um, you know, go look at, at, there's just so many talented hitters in our game right now. Go look at what they're doing, do that. Um, you know, and, um, and don't strike out, don't strike out until you're paid $40 million a year to, to, to strike out and just hit a bunch of home runs. Um, I wouldn't strike out if I were you. So. No, I think that's awesome. Uh, especially considering, you know, I think you kind of touched on it earlier, um, maybe in a little bit different sense, but, you know, I think today's hitters, kids lose finding who they are as a hitter. Um, you know, if you're a high average guy that can hit 360 to 380, hit a ton of doubles, do that. Yeah. Don't sell out for another 50 points lower um, so that you can hit a bunch of home runs. You know, I think it's funny because if you think about it, in the ninth inning with a guy on second and a tie game, one two, are you going to take the guy hitting 300 to go up to the plate or the guy hitting 220 with 60 home runs? Take the guy hitting 300 because he's got the best chance to get a hit and win the game for you. And I think that's something that's kind of going off what you said is lost a little bit today is, you know, and I know that the analytics tell you on base percentage yep. and extra basis, but there is and there always will be something to a batting average. You know, and it shows consistency. I think that's something that's lost today. Um, you know, it might not be as important as OBP and hitting a ton of doubles and over. But it does mean something because, you know, we know we can rely on you to get on base and make something happen uh, more than, you know, probably half the MLB and half the rest of the guys hitting out there today um, that are hitting 50 bombs and hitting 220 bombs. Well, the most important analytic that is there, and, and as far as I know, unless they're changing the game this year to exit VLO and launch angle, uh, get you extra runs, 
Um, runs are still the most important analytic stat I looked at. So we're either going to figure out how to get, get guys on base and then hit them in, um, or we're going to lose games and, and our launch angle and exit velo and, and all those things are, are, are really meaningless. Those things are teaching tools anyways. Um, they're, they're not to help you, help you, you know, win ball games. You got to understand the game to, uh, to be able to do that. But, but those guys, you know, all the, all the young players and high school players, you know, figure out a way to score runs. That's, that's, that's the most important. And then when you're on defense and you're pitching, you know, obviously do the opposite of that. So pretty simple. <laughs> it's simple. It's just not easy. Right. <laughs> so uh, well, coach, I, we don't want to keep you too long. I know your time's valuable. Um, love to have you back on. I feel I didn't even get into the one big thing I wanted to yeah. talk about with the whole recruiting side from past junior college. So would love to have you back on to dive into that a little bit more. And um I would you'd probably find me sitting in the stands of one of your practices pretty soon. I would love to Good. do it, man. So, um, but with that, you know, again, thank you for your time. Thank you for the insight, coach. Best of luck this year. Hang in there with all this COVID stuff. I know it's frustrating for you guys and the players with all the uncertainty, but, you know, we hope things start moving and we'll be watching and, and root for you guys this year. Hey, I, I really appreciate you guys having me and and um, thank you for doing this stuff. I, I think the more information we can get out to, to our young players, um, th we have the greatest game in the world. And and as 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 much as it drives us crazy, it's why we love it so much. And and um, you guys, I, I appreciate you guys having me on and allowing me to speak to 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 some people. And um, I wish you all the best. And, and if I, I'm available for you anytime. Awesome. Awesome. Always good Pleasure. seeing you, coach. Great. All right. All right. We'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.